this codebase.org live code hangout. In today's hangout, we are going to be working on recurring subscriptions with Braintree Payment Processor. This is a live code session. This is not a tutorial. I'm not so good at tutorials yet. Uh, we've been working on this project for uh, quite a while now, so I'm more in the habit of just hanging out online, on air, on Twitch and um, YouTube. Uh, and just showing you know what's going on on this is an open source project you can check out the get uh, source code on github.com slash Western friend uh, if you've got any uh, questions about the code yeah just let me know open an issue on github if you need to use the code for your own project feel free I can help you um, make some of it more generic and uh, hopefully it'll be useful to you we've got a lot of features here we've got e-commerce which we're working on today um, including a bookstore and magazine subscription. We've got a multimedia gallery. Uh, the magazine um, component of the website is actually several components as issues, articles, authors, keywords, and um, what are called magazine departments. Um, so there's many moving parts there. So it's quite an interesting project. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dig in. I sort of started the work in a uh, different little a moment ago and now we're back on track so our project is implemented in Django and Wagtail CMS and what we do is currently when people subscribe to the magazine they get the um, sort of premier access to articles that are uh, published within the last six months once an article turns six months old it's publicly available all the Oh, sorry, issues, which include the articles. Yeah, thanks <laughs> for keeping track of this account. I had a, some schedule confusion. It turns out, I guess, the meeting is not tonight. So welcome back. Uh, so I'm kind of hitting the ground running here, basically giving a little bit of a recap. So all the issues and articles going back to 1929 are publicly available. We just need a little bit of a revenue stream. Western Friends and Nonprofit. So I think, uh, you know, three issues, it's bi-monthly. Publication is reasonable threshold for subscriber access. Uh, what we have here is a page that lists all the people who have subscribed. Um, and the way we've defined the uh, subscription in our data model is basically some personal information here um, and the subscription type, which is an enum from our subscription model. We're going to have to change this because uh, we're defining the subscriptions now in Braintree. So I'm just kind of getting my bearings about how the code works. But here's the oops, subscription model. And it has a type. And we've got some choices here. Durations and discounts. It's going to be non-trivial stuff. Um, you know, one, two, and three years. We actually just originally thought it would be fine if people could just subscribe for three years. We wouldn't have to worry about the uh, recurring... Uh, subscription but in any case it came back up we want to try this so recurring subscription so here I am let me make a branch before I forget yeah, I believe master is up to date otherwise I'll just rebase it so yes print only yada 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 and we're gonna kind of <laughs> I think we're gonna straddle the fence a little bit uh, because we want to support recurring subscriptions and then non-recurring subscriptions uh, which just makes things more complicated. Okay, so I need to figure out basically when we render the subscription form. Let's take a look at that real quick. On the front end, hmm, there's slash subscribe. I don't have a route set up for it apparently. Oh boy. Let me just get this. My bearings. What is our route for the subscription form? I have to create a subscription page. I've been working on a content migration, so our content is sort of like not developed out. There are certain pages that are missing, one of which is the subscription page, I believe. Yeah, so we need that in order to, for people to subscribe. There we go. So yeah, the content, lives in the database and to a certain extent we can hard code things uh, 
subscription route, things like that. But one of the goals here is that the, um, hey, what's up, cyber guy? How are you doing there? Rich, did I change my microphone recently? Yes, I did. Is it, is it okay? I'm using the inbuilt microphone in, in the webcam. I sort of, uh, I got, we got a, a new computer and I want to use it for mainly music production. And I might do some live streams of that, but I've moved all the recording and uh, even speakers over to the new computer. This is my software development one in live streaming coding. And then the other one is really dedicated towards multimedia music released. Uh, I've tip, uh, historically done music on this computer as well. But I can try to adjust the um, speaker levels and maybe I'll look for a, a USB microphone or something like uh, But right now I'm just kind of, uh, it is what it is. <laughs> so now we've got a subscribe page. This was just to show us the, what the subscription form looks like. And you can see it renders out these subscription types. Now these subscription types are hard coded in the model. Uh, we want this page to be editable through the Wagtail editing interface so that the editor, content manager can um, you know, add information, add photos and things like that to the subscription page up here. But the form itself is kind of static. It's not gonna change. We got fields are you know, predefined, help text is predefined. Reverb and bass on my voice. Okay, I can actually Maybe I went a little overkill. I was worried that the microphone would be too faint, so I kind of pumped up the filters. Not so much, um, uh, I didn't add any bass or EQ, but I did add output gain. So I'm gonna drop it down to three decibels. Let me know if you can hear me in just one moment. Well, actually here it is with just normal, no, close to normal. How's that, is that any better? put a compressor on it and a limiter. That way if I talk really loud, if I get really excited, it won't peak out and blow your speakers. But I thought I would bump it up with the output gain, adjusting the output gain on a compressor. I don't know. Maybe that was a mistake. So now I basically have set it to zero, so it's just gonna do normal output. Oh, okay, okay, cool. I can go in between, it was, uh, I did a few tests to see how it sounded. Headphones, it seemed not too bad. I also put a little bit of a noise filter so it wouldn't, when I bump up the um, output gain, then it was a little staticky, so then I also put a um, noise filter on there to get rid of the hiss. But none of these should be making the uh, EQ levels change, should be. All right, but that's better now. Back to 10 decibels output gain. Very cool. All right, well, it's good to have some friends here, some familiar faces <laughs> or names. And yeah, it would be cool if we could uh, yeah, make these streams more social. I'm just not sure how to do it. No worries. It's always good to have feedback to improve the stream. Uh, yes, the main thing here, and I'll have to talk to Mary about this, is I thought we had reached a kind of a middle ground here allowing people to subscribe for multiple years, but she just doesn't want people to churn, and the recurring subscription is a good way to keep people, or that continuous revenue stream. So that means that these two fields, though, the subscription and duration, um, should only conditionally display when somebody doesn't want a recurring donation. So I'll have to use a little JavaScript here. I'll probably then keep, and that's another problem, I'll keep this, um, these subscription types will be hard coded. And if, if and when we define plans in um, Braintree, they may or may not correspond with these hard coded plans. So yeah, trade offs. All right, so then. What I'm trying to figure out to do here is in this subscription creation form that renders these fields, how do I pass in a little bit of a context? It's probably pretty straightforward. If I've just not done that, let me just check. So we've got a model form, base model form. 
like a get context method. What have you been up to, Rich? Any cool projects or uh, anything exciting? Any hobbies or exciting developments in your life? All right, so here's a base model. It looks like it does a lot. Is there a get context? Clean, post clean, validating. I just want to pop some data into the form before it renders. Another approach I could take is that this view renders the form within it. Um, I could pass in the data from the parent uh, parent kind of component into the form component. Post clean, that's after you submit it, update errors, clean is when you're validating it. Do validation exclusions. I guess it's in the super, or this initialization function. Let me just see if there's something in the docs for this. I reckon it should be common that people would want to um, pass in some context to a Django form. Mm. Uh, yeah, okay, that's pretty straightforward. So it's the init. Ah, it's pretty getting pretty warm here in Finland. It's only twenty, maybe twenty-five degrees at most centigrade. Um, man, that feels hot. <laughs> I don't know why. It feels so nice and sweaty though. All right, so then let's go back to our form model here, and I guess we just. Do a group. I don't know if there's a convention here, but do the init up front. That makes sense. Under init. And then call the super to get everything good happening there. And if anybody has a recommendation for like a not super expensive um, or complicated desktop microphone or like a headset microphone. I'll gladly, um, you know, get something. Uh, I think I have a Bluetooth headset, but it didn't seem like it was doing very good for live streaming. So I would probably need a USB one. Yeah. So any recommendations? I'll be glad to check those out. I have a sound module, a USB sound module, and a, kind of a relatively nice um, condenser mic that I've moved over to the other computer so I can record and, uh, you know, I want to leave it over there. So we got that quarry dogs. So yes, yes, did I have a typo there? Yeah, all right, and then we just add something to it. And let's just say test. And so self is yes yeah, in class. And I believe now I can modify form HTML and right underneath the page text, we should have the value of, te uh, of test. Something crashed on my computer. Good to go. Good to know. Refresh. All right. Uh, wait a minute. Wait. What do you return from init? Anything? Or it's just init, it's just something that calls and does stuff. 
In the form, page into rich text. Okay, form that text. I'm in the form template, but it's yeah. this that caused it to break so yes it's a model form vendor mm -hmm. net super it must be let me make sure I don't have a typo there but. Self into the DNet function. Okay, this is a test. All right, good. Learning journey. All right, now comes the fun part. Uh, I think we can get this list of um, plans from Braintree by using this their gateway. But I've got. I have to go a couple of steps back in the docs and figure out how to create a gateway instance and then I need my brain tree credentials, things like that. So hmm. but it's nice because it wraps everything uh, up for me. It gives me an object oriented approach to interacting with the brain tree kind of components. Pythonic or in your language of choice. Get started, I think, is where I gotta go. How do I create a gateway instance? Set up your client. Nice. My client and a nonce and some nonces and some token. What is in that? Pip install, yada yada. Gateway, here we go. Now, this is where I don't want to dox my self thing or whatever. I need my credentials, I'll have to put them in environment variables. Let's see here. What do we need? That's going to cause some havoc. Uh, let me just double check. I should be able to reset these credentials. If I can just reset my brain tree sandbox credentials, then it's not a big deal. Yeah, I can just, in fact, they give me some copy and paste code. Oh my goodness. Look at this, this is cool. I'll just show you. This is pretty good developer experience. So I'm, um, I'm on a sandbox, so go ahead and do what you want. I will delete these credentials sh shortly after this live stream. Uh, you can't do any actual transactions anyway here, but yeah, so I go to the um, uh, my profile API key client library. It's got the information there. I can copy and paste that into environment variables and things like that. It gives me a little snippet in my language of choice. And I'll just paste that in. And for now, we'll just work with it like that. I like that. 
I just gotta keep that from getting hard coded into the project. I should probably work with it in environment, uh, environmental variables anyway. Well, it's okay if this gets hard coded. Nice. All right, what we want to do is Yeah, so we've done transactions in the past, and basically, right now, I'm just trying to get these plans. So let's get back over here. Um, so we've got a gateway and some plans. And let's just say plans. Plans. Or, as my colleague Marcus would have me do. One less line. Okay, we're good. I'm copy and paste coding. Things I think are going to work out. Uh, let's just see what those look like when I iterate over those. And I should be running a debugger locally, but I'm not. I'm trying to think of a clean way of looking at these plans. Let's try running this in a debugger. Had troubles. I've had hit or miss experience with debugging in VS Code, mainly due to my ignorance. Let's see what we're going to launch a debugger Django project. And I can I should be able to refresh the page and it'll work right. It just would work. Maybe it just worked. No, I want to. Uh, didn't have it yet, does it? All right. Got some journal reminders, some stuff to do. Debugging is a, oh, 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 there we go, plan ID, plan A, <laughs> okay, okay. Description, so for plan plans. So we got some good metadata here, so let's do uh, What is it doing? 
I want to go on with it. I think we're going to move, remove this material design as well. clear and okay Create a select list of the plans, the value of the plan ID. The text here would be plan name and then some other metadata. The cost, but let's just see if this works. Oops, in four, we need in four. Attached to the form object. Okay, remember that. Work. Yes. Okay, so we'll get the other metadata in there. Cost. That's about it. The plan name should contain those types and the duration won't be relevant. So we'll get, put a little JavaScript in there uh, to conditionally toggle those. I'll probably just use jQuery. I don't want to add uh, whole no, too much complexity. There may be a more declared way of doing it, but for now, let's just keep things simple. If we've already got jQuery, we can probably find a quick way of toggling a, a couple of form fields based on a checkbox or a radio. <laughs> and then we'll call it good if we get to it. That'll be a good stopping point. So I think it was just plan price, I'm guessing. So I'll have to inspect the object again. Yeah. Mm, 
need that. Ooh. What does that do? Alright, so then just for the sake of testing things out, let's add plan B. This will be one million dollars. Mm, Twelve months never expires. Okay. Refresh. Yay. And my clever descriptions are not making their way into the um, <laughs> user interface, but might do some design on that. That would be pretty cool. Then it would turn more into a radio select or something like that. Hmm. Anyway, I've got a lot of money. Right, let's clean up a little bit. I think I should be really cautious and keep those sandbox credentials out of the code on GitHub. Double check something. Poetry actually, I think. source Maybe it's Pippin that does that. If you've got an inf file in the directory, it'll just source that for you when you start your virtual environment. Hello. Hey, welcome back, Rich. What did you make? What's for dinner? Is it dinner time? <laughs> time zones. Looking for a way to automatically source an environment, uh, some environment variables when I load a poetry environment so I don't have to <laughs> have my secrets in GitHub. I'm not really gonna do that in the long run, but uh, just for the time being, I'd like to just right away move them to an environment for, uh, file. All right. So 
Seems like this is still an unresolved feature request. I don't know, it's not really hard for me to source. Yeah, I can get it, I'll, I'll use that to get it into Python. I'm just trying to be lazy and not have to source the file every time. All right, so let's just do that though. Um, let me think here. Here we have dot end. Ah, dude, I already had it. Nice one. This is something I saw a while back and just didn't document for myself. All right, so let's use those here and source them. Yeah, OS environment. And then, and then. I'll have a potential of not having this environment very well. Things could break. Things are fragile. All right, so what is it in Gyron? Gyron dot get OS. Is that the one with the fallback? Fallback. Defaults. Ooh. And we will call this. I will have to just reset those public key, merchant ID, all that good stuff. Well, I can't reset the merchant ID, but anyway, this is a sandbox account. Okay. Yep, thanks. That's a good suggestion, Rich. What kind of burger did you get? A big old devil patty cheeseburger lettuce tomato mayonnaise got some extra commas there don't i no not there but up here my son and i we just were at the kind of the department store and they had this offer on a, one of those george foreman grills <laughs> i'll say the name it's like those flat iron grills because we don't have a grill in our neighborhood really we don't have a place where we could just grill sausages or burgers i can do them on the skillet uh, it's not the same though so now we'll be able to grill salmon and vegetables all that good stuff Ooh, red onion lettuce some sriracha that's good <laughs> a good addition okay so let's see i need to source that In debug mode, things are slow. Okay. I stopped the debugging. What is this? Good. Good grief. Wait, kill the server, right? Uh, the only other thing is then I need VS code to source it, don't don't I? Let's see. Maybe not. Even things. I heard a doorbell. But I don't have a doorbell. My neighbor's downstairs too. All right, let's see then, what do I do? So this is probably that it can't. I 
Like this should default to none, I think. The problem. Is that this debugger? If source the virtual environment, but it doesn't, uh, or it activates the virtual environment, doesn't source the uh, uh, in a pff, environment variables. Okay, so VS Code rescue. Where is it? So VS Code launch. Now, Jason, you can't have. Hopefully that makes uh, Chris be happy when I run the debugger and debug, go. Crispy, be happy. I just comment that out, things will work. No, they don't. We have to reload it. All right, Crispy is happy. They're too spammy. Ah, oh, it's just a dictionary. Uh, that may f may exist, which gives a default value. doesn't work. Let me just try it outside the debugger. Alright, and then the formal render. Empty empty selection. Okay. Yes, I've just never found really, I've never been happy with, every time I go into the VS Code debugger, something weird happens like that, and just things don't work. I don't know. I understand I'm pretty, like, noob to things, noob, noobish. My problem is probably I'm not reading the docs, but uh, in Python, well, I had an issue with it in a while back.
Oh. It's in the default location anyway, but those. Whatever. All right, so things are working. Uh, what was I going to do? What was my stopping point today? Getting these in the user interface and doing a conditional toggle. All right. All right, this is actually looking pretty good though. Um, so pass in brain tree uh, plans. Good brain tree plans. It'll be a temporary thing, but yeah, render break for that. Just kind of popped in the top of the form. Okay, so let me think. Without needing React or something, how do I do this conditional toggle? Where have I done this before? There are a couple of these lightweight, uh, more declarative uh, JavaScript uh, um, projects. I think we used one. And they just augment the DOM and they, they're progressively enhancing things. <clears throat> like Light DOM was one of them. Light DOM needed uh, JavaScript to be the main. So basically, why does it work in general? It's older browsers too. I, mean, I like it, it's just HTML at the end of the day. JavaScript. Maybe we can give this a try. And essentially, what we're after is um, we'll have a radio button with um, the data binding to a local variable and the values of the radio button will be recurring or off or something like that and when those um, radio buttons are toggled hey working with the front end has never been my thing I'm just not creative enough to design you guys oh I don't have to read things anymore do I <laughs> it's already on the screen yeah I've, I've been my background is as a web developer so I've you know been working on a front end or whatever um, for a while a little bit. I've been really kind of avoiding this dichotomy of front and back end. I think that's actually um, caused a lot of problems for people, and mainly because the comp the technology's gotten so complicated that you have to almost specialize anymore. And I really appreciate projects like Light DOM uh, that are just HTML, and you know your server just serves up HTML. And, uh, so you know I call my I've been called and I consider myself sort of a full stack developer just. When you develop a Django app, yeah, you're gonna write a little HTML and sprinkle this JavaScript. But I don't, it's not even really a full stack developer, it's just a web developer in that, in that sense. Mm, I, I'm, I'm kind of happy with that. So 
So I think, um, you know, we can have our cake and eat it too. I think we can try these nice things, but we're not have to have this whole crazy JavaScript build system, bloat, bike shedding, um, debris, field, uh, everything, uh, reinvention, constant reinvention and casting aside and factionalization and all that good stuff. Rich, have you looked at any of kind of the existing component libraries? Because I'm, I'm in the same boat as you with the creativity. I don't design UIs either, but most of like the web applications I use, um, they're kind of straightforward. They don't need too much advanced, like novel user interface components. I can usually get by um, with an existing pattern library. And so I'm kind of you know able to make a uh, relatively user-friendly interface with common conventions and maybe just using bootstrap. Uh, I, find, I find that's a pretty good approach. We are working on another project, uh, which I haven't seen you in a while, so I'm not sure if you've stopped in with the sustainable urban design platform. Have you seen, have you seen the live streams for that or check that code out? Um, for now, we're turning to a more full-fledged uh, JavaScript framework because of the Kind of the plans for the project are going to need a more complicated uh, user interface than we could just really do with jQuery and HTML. But we still just want to write, you know, HTML and JavaScript. And uh, for that project, I'm also just using a component library called Quasar. This is pretty cool. Check out this out. Uh, if you don't mind, like, I'm not trying to bike shed or camp, uh, get into too much of a argument here. I, I do see that there are a few of these front end frameworks that are, um, or component libraries that are more framework agnostic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is the project that was inspired by City Skylines, that's right. Yep, exactly. And uh, in the last couple of live streams, I've actually got the U, uh, UI prototype up and running. Uh, we haven't deployed it anywhere. It's just still in uh, its own little experiment folder. But I'm going to, this Saturday, John and I are going to live code on it. And we're going to integrate it into the back end. We've got a wagtail back end with a couple of features for an urban um, design pattern catalog and things like that. So it's just a sleepy map with um, some urban lenses, like design lenses on the side, you know, environment, uh, uh, utilities, mobility, um, amenities, uh, essential services, whatever, however we break those categories out. Uh, and on the right hand side is, uh, so those are uh, kind of those fly out menus. And on the right hand side, it's got like an inspector so that you can actually look at something and get additional metadata and tweak the properties, kind of like a, you know, you would do with a photo editor or something like that. So we're actually getting real. We're like kind of almost at a 0 0.1 alpha. And we're using this Quasar framework. So yeah, this it basically makes it really easy to, I don't have to like design those widgets. They're already there. <laughs> Let's see, where is the, uh, you know, like this flower menu. And it's pretty nice. This material design, I guess, is a pretty good thing. And I like it that if we do want to make, uh, like build it for, uh, some native installers, uh, like native, I mean, package it in a, a way that you can have an APK or a, something you could publish in an app store. This is going to give us that ability. It's pretty cool. Yep. So that we've been doing. So yeah, if you if you got time this Saturday. Four, about 4 p.m. Eastern Europe time. I think it's like 7 a.m. Um, California time. John gets up real early, which is really cool. I've been trying to do that lately. All right, so let's get back to it. So what do you think about this light dom? I like the ergonomics. I like the, well, I don't know if this will work though. So let's first try that. back to the form HTML and then we have um, section for 
custom or extra extra JS, I think is what it's called. Log. And in that block we'll need a script tag. Actually include that, which is fine. And let's just see if this Important random things from the web um, in an HTTP context, which I guess this is why this is not using a spec not specifying the protocol. Outside of module. All right, so that's what it is. Type me on it. Yeah. Hmm. All right. What kind of browser support will we get? Cool. All right, then we're going to create a light DOM instance. Which I'm just going to copy and paste and delete some stuff. Oh, yeah, let's just. One problem is I'm not working as a JavaScript file here. And then it's got a configuration object. Element will be. Hmm. Some reactive data. This is very much like the view API, but I don't even need the whole view um, logic. Although, view is pretty heavy. We're already using jQuery in our project. I'm just usually kind of nervous about see this crap. What is that? About including JavaScript dependencies. I might have to factor this out later, but uh, all right. So we'll just our data.
So this needs to go inside of the um, dynamic fields module kind of thing, whatever it would be called. And just make it a little easier to read. This will be subscription type. Uh, yeah. We'll bind it to there's a subscription type for consistency. And this will be recurring. Yeah, recurrent. We have a label there. I'll pretty it up. This is not too bad, but I have to handle events and stuff like that. And that's one of the nice things about the modern JavaScript uh, frameworks is they're getting you more in the declarative mindset, which I think is a really great thing. Is bringing you know declarativeness to JavaScript, which is normally imperative, where the DOM and the HTML and whatnot and CSS to a certain extent are declarative. So you can have like declarative coding at all of the layers. Uh, just some of the frameworks have kind of like gone to the extent of like reinventing HTML and CSS in JavaScript, and I think that's a little bit of a little bit of a little <laughs> bit of a fool's errand. Okay, let's just check it out. Once and recurring. All right, looks good. Uh, let's see if we got some data binding. I suppose I would just double check that by thing. Ah, uh, it's using single brackets so it doesn't collide with the Django fields. By default, wow. Crazy. This subscription type. Imperia, what up? Been doing coding for the past five days on a single project. What kind of project are you making? Go fish for school. All right, cool. Subscription. Let's see if that works. You see, Django uses double curly braces, and uh, Vue also uses double curly braces. So if you integrate Vue into Django templates, uh, they just have to change the um, delimiter that Vue uses. It's not a big deal, but it's kind of nice if this one just auto. Already doesn't collide, just a nice coincidence. I think that was by design of integrating with Django. All right, so refreshing and selection is recurring. Selection is once. Look at that. B data map binding already. Oh man, this is really nice. Okay. Light DOM. Oh man. If you oh, and it's part of JS.org, which is a uh, pretty good hands it's a nonprofit organization that has a couple good. Few good projects there. Can I turn up the mic a little bit? Yeah, let me try. My mic is over here, it's like a little bit farther away. Can boost it is 110 percent how's that is that a little better can you hear me a little bit better now 110 120 i don't want to get too much because then it'll start ecstatic -y. hey another one i have uh, is i've got a compressor that's boosted it a little bit but then i'm getting more feedback on my microphone today okay cool i boosted it on my system and then in obs and I'll talk a little louder. All right, so we got the data binding. Now the key thing here is I actually want to um, use the data to control the visibility of a field. 
means essentially that's this if uh, I guess I'll just hard code the subscription types here I'm thinking Yeah, because they're already in the DOM, and it's not too far to go find them. And the JavaScript is right here, and might move it to a different file. So then I could just do a little JavaScript there, you know. Let's do it. So we want probably a div, uh, or actually I could probably put it right there on that select, couldn't I? Just parent parent containers, if else. Okay. I'm getting a little tired here. So here it goes. Ah, oh, come on. Oh boy. Yeah. Not even able to type. So if is a special thing that's introduced by light DOM inside of the context. If equals and then there's just a JavaScript statement in here. So this dot subscription type triple equals uh, and single quotes string recurring Yeah, this is following suit with what view does. So put that inside there, close the div, and then the next DOM element huh. oh man, this is crazy, so I can put this right on the select Less is more. Yes, I believe this is going to work. All right, so how's everybody doing? How are you doing, Imperium? Anything new, exciting for you? Only visible if it's a recurring select prescription, prescription, restriction, ah, subscription. Now, the next, so I need to actually just move this. We're going to make a dynamic fields form now. So there we go. And then we'll put in these, and hopefully, Django will just ignore those. data now the fun part we've got these select the subscription type selector it's going to be controlled here i believe the next dom item will just need to be the else so this will need to be a div because it's going to be a parent for two items Ah, this 
kind of makes sense. I hope it works because it's essentially the current subscription implementation has the subscription type and duration. And we're doing a hybrid model, recurring and not. Let's just try it out. Okay. So, heck. All right. So, I'll pretty it up in a second. But you can see in that, yeah, it's really bad. I'm sorry. But it worked. Wow. Huh. That is cool, dudes and dudettes and people. All right, well, let's just start top to bottom and figure out how these styles are so bad. So bootstrap, radio button. I just need some classes here. Radio, radio. I think it's just form control. Let me just double check. We want to inline. All right, that should look a little better. Now let's see if we can clean up these other fields and call it good. Where are we at? A little over an hour and I did have a session. Okay, do I know anything about freelancing? Hmm, a little bit, not a lot. There we go, hey, that's looking better. What do you want to know about freelancing? That might be a better place to start. Oh, there's no freaking now. All right, well, I broke something. Or what it's worth if you're looking at freelance marketplaces, I recommend Upwork. Um, we have a small business and we hire uh, a couple people from Upwork. It's pretty good experience from a hiring standpoint. Uh, but I think they're pretty good about paying, you know, they hold the, I think just making sure payments get uh, automatically transferred to the freelancer, things like that. 
All right, so these are good. Now this is kludgy. So there we go, let's fix that. Oh, it's a grind. Yeah, that's a good point too. I don't recommend it. Um, in general, I think it's nice to have sort of a mission and um, working towards some kind of higher level uh, goal, whether it's, you know, and something that aligns with your personal interests and goals, right? Uh, but having a company that has a mission and a purpose uh, will be much more interesting work than uh, being a freelancer or a consultant where you're just kind of technology focused and you don't really get to know any particular problems too in depth. Uh, I haven't done a lot of freelancing a little bit and some volunteer work, but it's the most rewarding work I've done has been where I've been on a project for a long time and uh, particularly these ones that um, really resonate with like just really cool um, purpose and meaningful like effect on people's lives. Neuralink, whoa. Yeah, Rich, that was one thing I mentioned earlier. We were using Braintree, and um, by payment portal, like they do handle the payments in the, here I'll show you, sorry, it's actually over here. This is the Braintree sandbox. Uh, they handle the transactions, financial disputes, keeping people's records private, um, reporting and anal analytics, um, and then you know accessing the data. You can do that. This is their portal, but they don't give a uh, an interface, to my knowledge, for the actual people who are subscribing to manage their own subscription. Uh, if they do, I'll be happy to be staying to. Stand corrected because I don't want to have to uh, develop that if, I, if it already exists. But I don't think it does. I know PayPal, who which uh, which or who bought Braintree, does sub, uh, you know let people manage subscriptions and things, payment methods. I just don't think Braintree has that. Maybe they do. Neuralink. What is Neuralink doing? Are they um what are they the ones that kind of forked uh, that open source uh, Orange Three ML project? Watch the launch video. I don't know. I don't know. AI in the brain. What do they do? No recording of Stimulation. Ah, okay. Do they need neural implants or is it through like non invasive means? Ah, this is in place. Yeah, that's one. And Stripe actually does in place transactions too. Like you pay on and you don't leave the. And PayPal offers the option of doing that too, where you just don't you don't get redirected to another captive portal or whatever you would call it. Uh, it does a little bit of a poor user experience, in my opinion. Uh, it might lead lend people confidence, like, oh, it's PayPal. I'm familiar with that, and I do a lot of transactions on PayPal. But I know Stripe. You just have a credit card form, and you fill it, and you and you click pay, and you don't get taken away from the website. So I can actually show you. Right, the subscriber form. So let's just do a one-off. I don't know. If I go to subscribe, I don't know if I've got the page in there. It should be there. Uh, my form's not validating, of course, but. Uh, yeah, it's just an in, inline uh, pay, payment uh, form where you enter your credit card details, and it uh, on the front end it just encodes the data that as a an encrypted nonce and sends it to the back end. If we look here, the payment module. 
template payment processing. Uh, it's just really like a form with a pay button and then th this all gets sent to um, directly to pay Braintree, not PayPal. So yeah, that's I think part of why we went with Braintree because not only does it not take people away from our site, but it also gives us multiple payment choices. Uh, right now we're only looking at PayPal and credit card, but if we decide we can enable Apple Pay and several other things. It's a pretty cool service. I'm not even sure how I, I think I was just, re actually I know how I found out about it, is this book, Django 2, by example, um, they implement their online store with Braintree, and we checked it out, and it's pretty good. And all the source code is open on GitHub. So there's in the book you build like five or more projects, like a blog, an e-commerce platform, a social network. Uh, so it gives you real concrete examples. The book is pretty well written, and where I have found errata in the book, I've been able to kind of go directly to the source and find a working um, working code basically so this and I've acknowledged that in the readme for our project we've we've um, used parts of that book uh, specifically the e-commerce parts because that's non-trivial stuff and I'm not super experienced at that but that's why we're using Braintree I think it's a pretty good decision overall so, but if Braintree has a, a customer portal where they can update and manage their subscriptions, that would be super cool. I've never even looked this up. Everything is for developers, though. Hmm. Yeah, it doesn't look like they give them give the customers um, a way to manage their own, their own subscriptions. So, yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think it's gonna be too much code. I hope <laughs> I hope I don't just jinx myself, but uh, I just need to get this this working here. <clears throat> So let me just take this bootstrap markup. All right, so we get the row and then the row. Don't show these side by side. Maybe that's the least, the path of least resistance, least struggle. Teeth gnashing and hair pulling. How do I find packed material in general? Uh, on a scale of one to five, probably three. Uh, I think they're getting a lot better. They went through like five or so years where the, um, the editorial process, you could tell it was just um, a mess. Um, not only just, they were you know, having troubles with just like 
like kind of weird grammatical stuff, but also just like the code errata uh, would be frustrating. I think they were just trying to pump out a bunch of books and give people you know, these continual sales. Uh, but I think in the last couple of years, they've gotten a lot better. And I think the packed online, the subscription, I think it's like 10 bucks a month. That's worth it. That's one of the better values I've seen. Uh, O'Reilly still like, I've stopped buying O'Reilly. I haven't bought an O'Reilly book in like five years unless I bought a print one because they just switched to subscription only. It's like 40 or 50 bucks a month. You can't even really browse their offerings to see what's in there. Uh, so I think packed one out in that case. It's worth 10 bucks a month. My favorite, um, I have two favorite technical publishers, actually three. Uh, my, yeah, so I like uh, uh, Manning. They don't kind of cut corners on prices. Their quality is just consistently high. Uh, they've got really interesting uh, topics. I've sort of been leaning out of the, um, well, I don't know heavy artificial intelligence or machine learning type stuff, but they do have some good books on that. Uh, I'm kind of looking into some of the geospatial analysis stuff. So Manning's really good. Um, you probably know of them already. What I like about Manning is that when they do find a Reddit, they'll update the books often for years out or, you know, uh, so it's just continually up to date their there's not a lot of grammar errors, which can throw, I don't know, you know, just if you see obvious grammar errors, it can just kind of lower your impression of a book. And I know not everyone's a native English speaker, so I don't mean to um, be too kind of like judgmental in that regard. But uh, if you're a publisher and of publishing English language books, I think grammar is part of the editorial process. Um, then another technical book publisher who are just fun is No Search Press. And I think they even, you know, they have educational stuff. Ah, actually, Tea Tree, I gotta mention. This is really green tea press, not Tea Tree. Uh, these books are all free, or you can buy them. Um, think Bayes, if you're interested in statistics, Bayesian statistics, complexity, Python, uh, these are all kind of like written to be textbooks that are really accessible and are very pragmatic. They have real working examples, kind of like that Django 2 by example project uh, book. Uh, so this is a really great one. You probably have come by it a few times, particularly if you've browsed O'Reilly books. And then um, for not so uh, technologically um, specific, what is it? Well, that's Wiley. It's Island. Hmm. Oh, I just ordered them. One second. Well, actually, I don't, I don't know who to recommend now, but um, I think it's this Sage, Sage Press. They're a little bit um, more scientific-oriented, Sage, but they have some pretty cool books. We've been researching this urban design. Uh, not Sage Pressure Cooker. Don't, don't you do that? I was looking for pressure cookers though at one point. Sage Publications. Okay, so they're like textbook oriented. Go away. Uh, but we've got some pretty cool urban. They just publish a lot of books about sustainability and um, particular urban design. So I just got this urban analytics book, it's on the way. In this book, agent-based modeling and simulation is pretty, pretty trippy. 
Uh, and I guess the other books I got when I, you know, I work at a mobility company right now. And so I started this whole quest with um, this Rolf Ledge Earth Scan. I started the whole quest by looking at sustainable transportation and sustainable mobility. Rolf Ledge has some good titles in that realm. So, yeah, sorry, this is big. I like books and I like book publishers. So, you asked me a, a loaded question. Now you can auto correct me. CRC Press. Earth Scan. I think it's just Earth Scan. If you're interested in environmental science and sustainability and stuff, there's some pretty cool stuff. Actually, this was the first one that came to mind, in fact. See if I can just copy this. Okay, this is sort of the direction I'm trying to go in my life and career is, you know, creative and um, on one side creative and on the other side um, helping <laughs> helping with big problems, applying my abilities to solve big problems. You know, adding my little contribution to the bigger picture. Uh, So there's some pretty cool books here. Yep, so that's it. My living room is a little bit messy right now. I gotta clean up. I got stuff on the table. I got books on my desk. Anthropocene. Cool beans. Oh, they've got an offer. Oh no, oh no, you've done it. We're, we're actually researching Watershed. Oh, I'll tell you another cool one, Locate Press. They are cool. They, t they publish books on open source geospatial applications. Really good uh, topics. And even getting down into the Python coding for geospatial analysis, which I think our sustainable urban design project is going to have to probably get down in there uh, at a lower level using maybe some QGIS modules, maybe some PostgreS, um, PostGIS stuff, geospatial power tools. In fact, uh, my friend John is working on our hydrological feature right now, watershed analysis. Basically, you click on the map and it says, here's your watershed, and delineates the watershed around you. Uh, I think that's, he's reading this book. Not exactly sure, I'll have to ask him. Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern Europe time, like 7 a.m. California time. I might just be buying another book tonight. Two of them, so I can, Get 25% discount, free shipping. Ooh. Cool. All right. <laughs> Let me get back on topic. Closing, 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 closing. Open, leaving open. All right, so we had some ugliness. This light DOM is really cool for those who are interested in JavaScript. So refresh the page. Uh, all I've done is just uh, to take in those, um, yeah, basically, I need to delineate it a little bit better, but uh, these are just letting their own styling happen. I'm not specifying the width or anything like that. I think this is okay. So this field needs a label. We just need a little bit of padding there. Commit, push, call a night.
Uh, four is not. Oh, there it is. Spacing be above it, but margin top. Huh. Oh, I see, I see. Take this conditional and put it. And it needs a parent div, so okay. There we go. That makes it a little easier to read anyway. Scan it, you can see if this is da 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 else, and then the contents and the labels won't collide. We can call it a night. Cool. Quantum rated at the party earlier. That was cool of them. Uh, but then it needs to be required also, doesn't it? I'll get rid of the material design. So yeah, I think in, in summary, um, this wasn't as hard as I was thinking it was to get the subscription into the user interface and to do this dynamic form. Um, I'm pretty impressed by the documentation. The Braintree developer docs have been pretty good. They have SDKs in multiple languages, including this Python one, which was essentially one line of code um, after creating, you know, initializing um, a client to connect to the Braintree service with my credentials uh, or our organization's credentials, then it was like one line of code to get all the plans. It's pretty, pretty well designed and object oriented, Pythonic way of doing things. You see Java, not too bad either, is it? So, PHP. Yeah. Pretty much it's all just like pretty idiom idiomatic way of doing stuff for each language. Uh, yeah, and then this light DOM has been really nice. I've uh, been peeking at it for a while. I've been looking at some like lightweight alternatives to React and Vue that give you sort of, re you know, reactive and um, declarative data binding, two-way data binding, uh, but don't need a whole you know, build system or take over your whole front end. You know, Vue has a lot of um, pluses in my book by, you know, not reinventing HTML and by allowing for progressive enhancement. But this Light DOM has just really, um, I've just been really impressed. Uh, it doesn't quite have the same, anywhere near the uh, <laughs> development history, 84 commits, you know, or a number of contributors but it just does what it does. It's small, no JSX, no build tools, follows web component specs, V1. I just like that. You just define it as a JavaScript module, which I hope has a browsers that support ES 2015. So, 
and I use JavaScript modules. I had a script tag. Now let's see, not Internet Explorer at all. But Microsoft doesn't even support Internet Explorer. Uh, we're going back pretty far in Edge. Firefox, Safari. I don't know what happened to Opera. I thought they used to be pretty progressive with web standards. So we will have a little bit of browser compatibility issues with this, but I just like the code. I'm going to leave it as is. Uh, and then lastly, we just popped in some a little bit of bootstrap. So yeah, summary, summary <laughs> good docs from Bra uh, Braintree. Light DOM is an excellent uh, lightweight declarative data binding library for JavaScript. They use just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript modules. Uh, and then just some tweaks to the bootstrap. So we've got a, ooh, what happened to that? I was able to wrap this up. Oh, that must have been an old tab. <laughs> good, good stuff. All right. Well, thanks for everyone for stopping in and chatting. Cyber guy, Rich, Rich, that is just your name. Nice. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Imperium, good to see you again. Let's see. Keeping track of this account, I was here earlier. And prior to the stream, I was having a conversation with Quantum, who raided with a party of three. Appreciated seeing all these familiar names and faces, and uh, hope to somehow get this stream to be, you know, more interactive. Um, you know, doing things, adding the chat, improving the sound quality, whatever you'd like to see on the on the stream to make it more engaging, uh, make it more community oriented. I'd be glad to make uh, to take suggestions. Like we're also doing, for example, live coding with this um, VS Code live share. It's pretty cool. So if you ever want to jump on a live share session, let me know. We got a lot of cool projects. So let me just commit this. Push. All right. Well, thanks again to everybody who's stopped by the Twitch stream. This has been a CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. If you'd like to get involved with this or other similar project, stop by CodeBuddies.org. There's a lot of study groups um, forming around different topics, uh, mostly, of course, code-related, um, computer science-y stuff. Uh, and everybody on CodeBuddies is both a you know a learner and a teacher at the same time. We know everybody's uniquely. Uh, has their own learning path that we've taken and we've all got something to share and something to bring to the table um, if you're interested in getting involved with a sustainable urban development or design project uh, stop by this channel or codebase.org on the, this coming saturday around 4 p.m eastern time uh, we've got a really cool demo and we're going to do some further development to get our 0.1 alpha prototype <laughs> to take shape CodeBuddies.org is also an open source project. If you go to github.com slash CodeBuddies, you can get involved uh, with the CodeBuddies version 2 project. We're rewriting it from the ground up with Django and React. Thanks again for hanging out. Have a great day and stay safe. Enjoy the weather if you've got this nice warm weather we have in Finland. <laughs>